Do you... let's, let's do a little centering just to get started. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. So taking a moment to uh, uplift our posture, lengthen the back of our neck as we inhale, and a long exhale, soften our chest, breathing into the earth. And as we inhale again, relating to the sky and that quality of openness, and as we exhale, settling and relating to the earth and that quality of settledness. And let's take a moment to appreciate the space around us in the sense of our personal space extending out into the room. So there's openness and expansion behind us into our left and right, in front and above. And also recognizing that that openness is a resource. It connects us to all things. And then taking a moment and appreciating our breath. Just the richness of each breath. And perhaps we could invite a quality. What would it be like if there was just a little more? Ease, appreciation, confidence, and enjoying any little shift that might occur. <clears throat> so welcome everyone who is online. I'm, I'm delighted to share with you some of the musings from my experience in South Africa recently and a little bit of our sense of excitement with some of the shifts that are going on in terms of the work that we're doing. Uh, South Africa was amazing as always and one <clears throat> the new piece was the Fetzer work that we um, worked with some people, a variety of people actually. Some of them were underprivileged people from the townships and some of them were more um, sort of in-between people who work with people teaching them or facilitating people from the townships. And in the room there were a wide variety of people. There were some people who were in the teacher training from a more privileged background and people, uh, a couple from Zimbabwe, a lovely couple who were somewhere in between in terms of a life of privilege and a life of disadvantage and myself Angel Williams and R.J. Jennings from the U.S. So it was a really wonderful variety and to see everybody sharing their stories and talking together um, was a, a wonderful experience of a fruition of a seed that I had imagined in 1997 when I went to South Africa first and thought wouldn't it be great if people from all different backgrounds and all different experiences could come together and just share stories and connect. So that was really exciting and thrilling and, uh, and just such a great learning uh, for us because especially uh, the mandate for the FETSA work was the whole um, notion of love and forgiveness and the inquiry around that and how we might spread it um, further into the world. So it was great learning in terms of interviewing people and noticing their, um, how that evolved as they began to talk about love and forgiveness. Um, great teaching for me. And one of the pieces that came out of it that was the most um, sort of standout piece for me at this time is um, what I noticed is people whose lives are more baseline survival and simple who don't necessarily have a lot of sophistication in terms of their education or their life experience, were able to relate to love and forgiveness very simply and very straightforwardly. <laughs> and uh, the people who had more sophistication, more education, um, were more uncertain or confused about love and forgiveness. <laughs> uh, and in some ways not able to sort of get a grasp for themselves fully. Um, the people who were more sophisticated had the issue around 
forgiving myself. And then we have this whole, what is myself thing. Um, so that was just a huge learning for me because I um, hadn't thought about it in that point of view. But as I think about it, it makes perfect sense that um, our sophistication doesn't always um, help us 100% in terms of you know, how we live uh, skillfully. There's a quality in South Africa that is a little bit more um, straightforward in terms of how they experience um, difficulty in their lives. Uh, <clears throat> I think for a number of reasons. There's an energy in the um, country of South Africa that's based on the fact that it's primarily African people there. There's a huge number in that the, the white people and the people of color who are not strictly South Africans um, are in the minority. And the thing about the South African people, uh, when I was there in 97, I had that first experience of saying to somebody how different it was to meet someone and not have them size me up the way we often size each other up. Hmm. Uh, when we meet each other, where are we on the spectrum of this or that? And some of that has to do with people of color. And what this young man said when I mentioned that to him was an African man who had been educated at Stanford, actually. And he said, oh, yes. He says, that's because we've been here for four million years. We know who we are. You, on the other hand, don't have a clue. And I thought, oh, that is so right. <laughs> and so there's a way that the people of South Africa experience life um, almost a little bit more directly and simply. And that has rubbed off on some of the South Africans who live there who are white South Africans, or what they call colored South Africans. Um, so in that way, it's different than the people in the US who have a lot more, I think, complexity and a bit of confusion about who we are, basically. Um, we don't have that sense of cellular lineage as strongly um, sort of on the surface as what I experienced in South Africa. Mm. So therefore, around issues like um, love and forgiveness or issues of <clears throat> um, people having more disadvantaged lives, their perspective is often a lot more straightforward um, than I experience here. Well, when we did the FETSA work, we didn't do a full level one. So we didn't do leader, follower, yeah. advocating, listening. <clears throat> and there were some reasons for that. Um, those are actually very sophisticated exercises and they imply a whole sense of uh, being in relationship in a particular way. So that's a sort of another learning that the people there, um, their sense of leadership just has to do with uh, an immediacy of am I going to be able to get money to keep the lights on? Am I going to yell at my son or am I going to ask him politely? Am I going to be able to, um, if I can, because there's wonderful people who develop the clothing bank, giving some of these people from the townships um, a way to learn how to earn money and do business. So what they do is they get um, clothes from stores like <clears throat> Truworths and Woolworths, which are like Macy's and Nordstrom's here. And they, um, they're clothes they would throw away normally because whatever reason. And they bring the women in and they let them buy them quite cheaply and they can on-sell it in their community. Mm. But they teach them how to do business, how to on-sell it and they have leadership programs and so on for them, um, coaching programs. But what they really are working with is a very basic level of if I get some money and I just go ahead and spend it all, even if it's on food or electricity, then I don't have any way to buy more clothes so that I can get more money. So just these kind of basic skills of those kinds of levels of leadership are very different than the leader follower that we do in our level ones, mm -hmm. which are based on the sense that I know I can walk forward and have that kind of positive feeling. For them, because they were mostly women too, they don't have a sense they can walk forward and have a positive feeling. Mm -hmm. The women hold a lot of the community together, but they don't have the overall leadership. Mm. So it's quite different. 
And how were you received as an American white lady coming over and, and you know, teaching them and working with them? Well, you know, that was the most um, wonderful thing and a great learning for me, too, is that um, in the U.S. there's a lot of politics around <clears throat> someone trying to help someone else. Lots of stuff about who do you think you are trying to help me, you wouldn't know how I feel, or I don't need help, or whatever this stuff is. But in South Africa, and I'm going to imagine in Africa in general, anybody who wants to help anyone at all is a wonderful, accepted person. There isn't any who do you think you are that you're a white person coming in. The women who founded the clothing bank are both white, and the women from the townships call them their savior and say that if it wasn't for them, they'd be on the street, and they love them. So there isn't that sense of um, politics around helping in South Africa. Anybody who wants to help at all is completely appreciated. What we're trying to do and what the clothing bank does is give them a hand up rather than give them a hand out. Mm. So the hand up is to give them some ability to work with their, um, their reactiveness because for a lot of them, they're reactive. Someone hits them, they scream at them. So to be able to not scream at them, but ask someone nicely, please don't do that. I mean, there's one story of a woman who, she went back after one day of the workshop and to her house and she hadn't had the money to pay to keep the electricity on, so the lights went out. And she takes care of her granddaughter. She lives with her granddaughter who's eight. And she went to find her one candle that she has, and her son, who had just gotten out of prison, who was living with her again, had taken the candle, so she had no light and had to sit in the dark. So when the son came back, instead of yelling at him, which she said normally I would yell at him, I asked him very nicely, please don't take my things again. Um, leave them where they are so I can have a candle if I can't afford the electricity. And she said her son was kind of stunned. <laughs> he said, yes, I, I will. And because she was very centered, she said she did the breathing, she centered, and she felt so good about herself mm -hmm. that she was actually able to handle that with more dignity. And she realized that that was also going to help her son um, be more respectful of her and not take her things. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like a small victory on one level, but it felt like a huge victory in terms of um, her being able to change that experience of frustration that was so she was so accustomed to in her house. Mm -hmm. so, so it must be a very different experience kind of languaging the leadership embodiment work to this group. And I, I imagine it's very different than languaging it to like, you know, a vice president somewhere or, a, you know, somebody in the West who's in business, that kind of thing. So how do you, how do you talk to them about the work there? Or is, is there some way that comes out of you that's a different way of kind of speaking about? And, and that's been a huge learning. And Karen White really help, has helped too because she lives there and has more of a sense of <clears throat> their circumstances. But um, for instance, when we invited them to do looking at it from another person's point of view, the basic entering and including exercise, um, that was really something that was very hard for them to grasp at a fundamental level. So <clears throat> to take it down a whole step and just say, look, we were in this room and there was a kind of a theater room, so there was a stage on one side and doors on the other opposite the stage. So Karen was able to help us by saying, <clears throat> okay, so you're facing the stage and I'm facing the doors. I can't see the stage because I'm looking at the doors. And if I walk around behind you, I go, oh, there's a stage. I didn't see it before. Because you were telling me there's a stage. And I said, no, I'm, there's not. I'm seeing the door. So it was amazing to have to break it down at that level for them to go, oh. And even then, the idea of looking at it from another person's point of view was a huge sort of piece for them. And it wasn't like an automatic, oh, right, look at it from another person's point of view. Mm -hmm. Like that wasn't, that's not part of, it wasn't, now it is a bit 
part of how they might experience the world and work with something. Mm -hmm. So of course that's quite different than what we have in Western culture, which is to say, we'll look at it from that person's point of view and people go, oh yeah, I could relate to that, at least as an idea. For them, even the idea was obscure. Maybe it's obscure for us too and we just pretend <laughs> it's not. Well, I think that's probably a really good point because that was very straightforward for them. Um, so there, it was quite, there was such a huge learning in, you know, it's a very different situation for some. Now, there were also some people who were teachers and they grasped those concepts much more similarly to what we would. So it was amazing to have this wide range. What I loved was seeing how <clears throat> when they did grasp the idea of being centered, they could, um, they had such joy about it. It was like, oh, this is so great. And I could breathe and they could giggle and laugh. And um, just to see how much um, brightness that brought to them. And one of the things that they get more easily, of course, I think, than some people in the West, or at least in the US, is the idea of shared space is a no-brainer. Hmm. They don't have such a strong tendency toward individuation as, they, they do have a sense, I have to do this myself, but they don't have the sense that um, I'm completely alone. Because the nature of that land is, it comes from a very strong thousands of years of community. And it's not like their ancestors sailed on a boat and arrived and had to build a community. Um, 200 years ago. Hmm. It's like that community, that sense of community is in the, it's in the, in the I I air, it's in the, and so that sense of shared community and how to um, be inclusive, which we work with more, we have a little more emphasis on the details of that in this culture. Um, for them, speaking up was huge. And so hmm. to, have them come up with their declaration and say it, and say the, the sort of um, way they would giggle and almost be self-conscious that they'd spoken up for themselves. Um, what, a, what a kind of novel idea that was, besides just yell at their husband or someone in their family because they took their stuff or they weren't respecting this, to speak up for what they wanted to accomplish. Um, that, that was very uh, profound. And it gave me such um, incredible appreciation mm. to see um, them stepping into that and beginning to develop that muscle a little bit. What what kind mm. of what kind of declarations did you hear them say, and maybe contrasted with declare the kinds of declarations that you hear from people here? Well, there, there was a, a wide variety from you know I'm committed to stop drinking um, to I want to become a social worker to take care of older people, hmm. to support them. I'm committed to developing the skills to actually become a social worker. Hmm. Um, another woman was committed to um, buying this land so she could develop a school. And <clears throat> some of them were committed to being um, sort of less angry or something. So it was a wide variety that way. Um, and for the most part, you know, we're again, we get more complex about our declarations and what does it mean. And for them, although it wasn't easy to think about themselves once they did, there was much more a sense of, here's the peace. Hmm. And I think, again, because our lives are more, um, we have more layers, more geological layers that are constantly working on us. Um, it's sometimes not as easy or clear for people here, whereas there, once they got it, then they could really line up to it. Hmm. South Africa is really far away, and you're not South African. So what's the connection? What, what draws you there to do this work? Well, when I first went in 97, I um, told people I fell in love with the country. Um, the land is very appealing to me. It's, um, it's actually, a lot of it's very similar to the Bay Area, only a little bit more dramatic. Um, flora and fauna are similar. Um, 
And I think what appealed to me besides that, and the people are just some of the most beautiful, nicest people in the world. Tefani always says, she sums it up by saying, in traffic, everyone lets everyone else in. Nobody goes up so that you can't get in. Sometimes I'll let two or three cars in. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Um, but I, I think it gets back to a little bit of that first piece I talked about of the people knowing in their cells, having a sense that they belong, having a sense that there's um, a place for them and they're not having really strong cases of who am I's. And for me, the sense of who am I has always been, since I was very young, a huge sense of inquiry and and disturbance. Um, and to be there in this land where that doesn't vibrate as highly, there's more of a sense of we're here and we work together and we do things and we want to help out, hmm. is stronger than who am I, what am I supposed to be doing, uh, who, who am I in relationship to other people? How do I make myself more of this or that? That kind of, um, I'll use the word almost insecurity, is not as strong there. Um, and so I really like being there because it helps my, that part of my soul or spirit that wrestles with those mm. issues calms down when I'm there. Mm. And I think that's part of what um, the deep attraction is. Mm. So we're right in the midst of shifting the name of the work from conscious embodiment to leadership embodiment. And in terms of the forefront of your work, is there any, um, is there a particular piece of leadership embodiment that you're excited about that you feel like is um, sort of unfolding more right now? Um, yes, it's exciting. We've shifted, we've officially decided to shift the name from conscious embodiment to leadership embodiment. And for some of the reasons that um, you've mentioned um, in the postings that you've done, um, for the most part, it's more accessible to people, especially in foreign countries, where conscious embodiment is very hard to translate and leadership embodiment is easier. Um, and also, what's happening is we're starting to focus more on um, how to create variations and adjust the principles so that they're even more accessible uh, to people who are working in leadership organizations. And we're working more with, we do a small exercise, the centering, for instance, and then right away take it into a conversation. How does that relate to how we might talk with each other? Because primarily people will be having conversations with each other. And so um, some of the shift is for every somatic exercise we do, we then have a conversational equivalent immediately. Mm. So that's quite exciting for me because it creates a lot of re relevance for people as they're um, in their everyday lives. And we can also adjust their leadership challenges, whether they're domestic leadership challenges or um, organizational leadership challenges, we can work directly with those challenges from the point of view of an exercise, and then here's the conversation that it would represent. Um, and what we're finding, too, is in working with the conversational piece uh, that people start to recognize that when they're in the more centered state, they actually speak differently. They don't have to think about how they should speak differently. It happens organically um, because the centered state actually changes the chemical makeup that's going through the body, which therefore changes the nervous system, which therefore changes the way the brain operates. So by centering, we're actually accessing different parts of our brain which allow us to speak more uh, authentically and usually with more um, sense of confidence and clarity. Can you give us an example mm -hmm. of, of that shift from someone you've worked with recently or? Well, yeah, um, working with um, one person, they wanted to speak up for themselves around um, 
a position that they wanted to have. And when they were in personality, they had a really hard time speaking with a sense of confidence that they, so they would say something like, you know, I really want to be the chair of that organization because um, I really want to help people and, and I think it would be good. And they had this apologetic quality to them and a little bit of self-consciousness. And once this woman was in the centered state, the, her voice tone changed, her pacing changed, and she was able to say, I'm committed to becoming the chair of this organization because I know that I can support women going forward to be more empowered, to be stronger, to feel better about themselves. Mm. And what, what languaging did you use to coach her into that, you know, out of the personality and, and back into the center? Well, it, of course, what preceded it was the centering exercise with physical pressure mm. so that she could start to get the distinction between when she was constricted and her personal space was pulled in. She was not able to access that kind of confidence, that kind of natural um, enthusiasm about the work she wanted to do. But when she was extended and we had her do the practice where she really extend out, extend into the far corners of the room, uplifting, settling. So she'd done that with pressure, physical pressure on her. The physical pressure allowed her to have a clearer sense of distinction between these two actually muscle groups, mm. the flexors and the extensors. Uh. So when she did that, then when she was sitting, I coached her into using her extensor muscles instead of sitting and firing flexor muscles. These are flexor muscles. These are extensor mm. muscles. And so it, it actually, in a way, is that the foundation of it is a muscle group that we're using. And so she was able to get that. That was not rocket science to her. It was a little bit, she had to work for it to keep those extensors firing because what she was familiar with and what was more comfortable was her personality's uh, tendency to um, constrict a little bit more and pull her personal space in. That's cool. Well, I'm sure whether we know it or not, we're all, you know, the, the, the leading edge of our lives are all stepping into some bigger thing. And so I was wondering if you wanted to close by kind of just sort of coaching all of us into, into that and sort of, you know, reaching out and claiming the next thing in our lives. Well, yes, and let's start with the contrast. So if we could all fire flexors a little bit. So the flexors, of course, are um, the, what contracts the, the body and the muscles. So if we could just do that and tighten and pull in a little bit. And then have a sense of your personal space, how big it is. And mine's very tight into me. And then we'll start by um, letting the arms uh, rest on our legs and inhale and lengthen the muscles on the back and exhale keeping the long muscles on the back soften the front and maybe we could think of our body as a big tube and that uplifted quality toward the sky simultaneously going with the settled quality into the earth and then just for a minute let's um, reach out with our arms, the fingertips extending out to the far corners of the room and expand out all around so we're fully filling the room. Now keep that sense of expansion but let your arms rest back again on your, on your legs. And then see if we can have a sense of um, maybe inviting a quality or energy from our teachers and mentors to come through us a little bit more. We might invite that sense of porousness so that we're actually a conduit for energy that's more uplifting and expanding and bright and sunny. And this could be a good way for us to move forward into our day or evening, depending on where you are on the planet. And um, radiating good energy out into the world and sending good energy to people who could use our support. There are many people 
I think, who could use a little bit more sunniness, a little more brightness in their lives right now. Hmm. All righty. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank you. <laughs> then thanks for tuning in. All right.